So this is a short that I wrote today sitting at the library. We have 24 hour a day libraries, imagine or not. For example, the Warsaw University Library. So we want to be a human. For the versatile mind, for the ingenious magician, everything is an inspiration. Encountering a plethora of esoteric writings, visions of individuals, grimoires, I have learned one thing. They are useful insofar as you overgrow the vision contained therein, if they are read like compendia of experience. Otherwise, you make yourself into a victim of someone else's vision. Become a visionary yourself, charting your wayward signs in territories unknown. Intuitionists oft say that the value of experience is greater than that of theory and knowledge. Yet, these who surpass them in experience and are equipped with robust theory and knowledge are ardent students of the universe, not some boorish dilettantes. The value of critical conjoining of multiple fields of science and arts in order to give them an ever fresh look is the juvenile gladness of exploration and synthesis of information and ideas in the laboratory of imagination and notion intersecting with great laws of the world. The glass bed game of infinite libraries of understanding, play, appliance and inventiveness. They provide unexpected results and bring about the intellectual pleasures of voyaging into terra incognita, in a world in which everything was discovered, taught already, everything invented. That sentence is blatantly incorrect. It is held as valid only by the defeatists. In the process of discovery of magic, of the divinities, I found that there are several components that are required. Gathering life experience to draw from, a spacious, large, solid and vivid mind, sometimes insane, and great nature. A great imagination, a studious inclination, a will to experiment, order and discipline that sets coordinates are right. A principled ethos and wayward direction, a resilience to damage and danger. Discernment and strength, focus and concentration, daring to create new theories and test them, an intelligence to see the realization from delusion, a piercing insight into causalities, that is wisdom, a heroic stance in opposition, an invincible spirit, a focused will, a golden mean, an inner truth, a perseverant, unshakable character, not to be confused with foolish stubbornness. A strong guiding daimon, a durable commitment to fortunes, a love of the strange awe oh, and terror, clinging to beauty and virtue, fates and destinies, and a reverence for the universe and all its teachings. A grand will to return to the beautiful, the strong, the just, the great, the noble, the free, the victorious, no matter what ordeals of life we must pass and traverse, especially when we are turned into petty, cold hating wretches. Now, this is a mere enumeration, but where to get these qualities from, you ask? They are coined along life through confrontation, traumas, wounds and scars that we receive, decisions and judgments, reaction to fortunes and fates, affirmations of despair and eudaimonia, that is happiness, losses and gains, weighing and setting aspirations, one and for all, once and for all, ask yourself a question. Would you like to be in 5, 10, 20 years time? Who do you want to be posthumously? It is not a question about your job, but about your essence, your diamond, your ethos and character, your nature and qualities, your attributes. For what constitutes a man, a woman, is this single sentence. Omnia mea me comporto. Everything I have, I carry with me, within me. Bemento mori, Marcus Aurelius once wrote, invicti geniae, I might add. The spirit that you coin of yourself may be victorious, but what you make in the battles and wars of life is yours, forever for the taking. A goal set must be pursued recklessly, you can't imagine to succeed if you don't embark upon the Pythagorean journey. If the ball is empty, you can draw clay from it. In other words, if your life is empty, dispossessed, underprivileged, you must find the clay. If you find that clay, you must shape it. The first move to find that clay is the enchantment with the world, to find the little gods of life, perspective changes everything. When you walk through a park, you may see nothing but the tip of your very nose. When you look at people, you are observant. But when all of a sudden you observe a leaf of a tree and think about the greatness of nature, about harmonies, intervals, sounds and colors it conjures, about the sylvan spirits wandering amongst it, 
when you take the dew and draw war paint across your face, the ancient thoughts of the forest superseding the thoughts of men, the continuity of the cycles, sequences, the impermanence, the well of the abysmal past immemorial, the moon, planet and stars above observed by so many ancient civilizations. At this point you redivinize your gaze, you acquire truly Edenic perception. When we think Edin, an old Arabic world word for long dry plain, pasture land, we may think of Ubar of the King Shaddad, buried under the deserts of Rubal Kali. It is hidden from the view, occulted just like our perception of this world. When we recognize this, we may shed the veils of Isis at first delicately, giving us a cognitive glimpse. Some of us are truly rewarded by the great goddess that makes us see among the blind men. We find divinities everywhere, not as imagination, but a truthful spectacle of muse-like inspired beauty of Agathos Daimonis lifting the veils. Some posited that nature and matter is the source of all evil in this world, in contradistinction to an ensouled life. I prefer to treat it as a gift of Aphrodite Urania Genetrix, or tripartite Hecatedrachina Epigorgidia, the tower, the divine fire, the cosmic ether, the abysmal void. Ah, so you've been assaulted by all hells combined, you've been terrorized by demons and devils. Bite through the rotten flesh, cold scorching heat, turmoils of winds, bare survival and barren deserts. Thirst, hunger, slay if you must, be slayed if you can defend yourself. Grind your teeth and feel the pain, overcome suffering, emerge triumphant like an aria. There were people that died frozen in the Antarctic or the Himalayas, those who were slain in wars, tortured and mutilated, murdered by bestial men, raped, those who died of parasites, lepers, illnesses, committing suicides and great torment, insane out of pain, woe and sorrow. There are so many ways to die. Get yourself killed. In great or small pain, with or without dignity. Violated in body, soul and mind, stripped of honor and name, so many ways to suffer in torment, to be deprived of humaneness, vendettas of humans against humaneness are great. No, no, gods don't contradict nature, nor add more meaning to all this. It is the anthropocentric view that made this infantile complex to scream, Injust, injust, save me, oh you mother, oh you father in disguise, who nurtured me. It is the self-importance of humankind that attaches the idea that retribution is neither is justice, some justice, any justice to pay for my pains. Laws of nature don't contradict laws of gods, yet they are different. Laws of humans oft contradict both laws of nature and of gods. Yet by oath under heavens I may swear that by heroic memory of those who made something of themselves in this world, despite all of that, those who out of their titanic commitment pitched to the divinities, to nature, to the world are recognized as heroi. No matter what was their status, wealth, material fortunes, an imperial beggar is an emperor among humans in perception of gods. An emperor that is a wretch is nothing more than a wretch among humans to the gods. Thank you.